Good afternoon. I'm Merck Merkier. I'm the director of the engineering management program in the college, and it's my pleasure to substitute for Dean Seabass, who happens to be out of town today. This is the Herbst Program of Humanities for Engineers Lecture and Discussions on Technology and Responsibility. Uh, this afternoon, we're offering the third in this series. The first was entitled Professional Education and Examined Life. Uh, the second was Engineering Education and Managerial Responsibility. Today, I think we have a most timely and certainly an interesting topic, the ethics of arm manufacturers. I'd like to introduce the moderator of this series, uh, Professor Tanasi Mulakis. Uh, Professor Mulakis is the director of the Herbst Program in Humanities, and I'll ask him to introduce our panelists. Tanasi? Thank you, Mike. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to yet another of our lectures. It is my pleasure to have seen that our program of Humanities of Engineers has been able to spawn a number of other activities that will broaden the horizons of the mission of this school uh, to be much more than merely a first-rate technical school, but one that really encompasses uh, the fullness of an activity of responsible engineers and of engineers who lead a full life. Uh, the topic of today, as Merck said, is obviously of crucial interest, and I think it is, as it were, symbolic of the meaning of our whole, of our whole series. It, it brackets precisely the uh, social, ethical, and technical responsibilities together, and it is my great privilege to be able to introduce a most distinguished panel in indeed. I have first uh, with us an alumnus of this college, uh, Peter Tietz, who is uh, a president of Martin Marietta, somebody who has a vast experience in, in uh, making the things we're going to be talking about and knowing about how to face so many of the problems that, uh, that are met by um, this uh, uh, engagement. Uh, he is uh, ha the recipient of a great many of our awards. He is very active in the uh, uh, in the uh, Engineering Development Council. He is, in other words, one of the important advisors uh, that our school has the benefit of uh, enjoying in developing its further programs. Next to him is sitting Sandy Lekoff, uh, an old friend uh, who uh, has come all the way from California to us. After a very distinguished career at Harvard and Toronto, he became the founding uh, chairman of the Department of Political Science at the University of California in San Diego. He has been interested in a great number of topics from political theory to public policy, and he has had a particular interest in the inter interface, as they say, of technology and politics. He has written extensively on these subjects, and the last product of that is one, uh, or one of the most recent products of that, is a rather remarkable book, A Shield in Space, that has to do with uh, uh, which he wrote together with Herbert York, and which, uh, as Robert McNamara says, is the best he has seen, namely Robert McNamara on SDI. Uh, next to Sandy uh, is Richard Devon, who is somebody who wears so many hats that it is difficult to, to, to pick the one out that, that, that matters the most. He wears them all very well, and it is a great privilege. He came all the way from the East Coast. Uh, he is a professor at, 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 at Penn State. Uh, he is engaged in the same kind of activities in many ways that we are, that is to say, bridging uh, the world of the humanities with the world of, of technical development, with the world of technical education. He has had uh, uh, an important role in the uh, uh, um, um, in American Engineering Society, uh, of which he has been the chairman of the Liberal Studies section, uh, and is also uh, uh, chairman now, I believe, of the uh, of, of the Public Policy section. But he is here today, uh, representing, I think, uh, the um, uh, primarily uh, the uh, uh, Society of, of Engineers of, of Concerned Engineers, and it is in this capacity that I will introduce him primarily. But again, I remind you that you're meeting a very complicated and, and uh, uh, distinguished panelist. Gentlemen, Mr. Tietz. Thank you. Thank 
Thank you, Professor Malakas. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's a pleasure and really an honor for me to be here today to speak to you on this subject of the ethics of arms manufacture. You know, it's a, a wonderful and a precious privilege to live in a place that not only allows but encourages its citizens to engage in open dialogue on any and all important topics like the one we'll be discussing today. I congratulate and welcome those of you in the audience. Like you, I am here today to learn and to expand my horizons and through the remarks of the other panelists and uh, our distinguished moderator, uh, I hope to learn a lot. I hope to contribute also by giving you some insight into how I've formed my views on this important topic of the ethics of arms manufacture. As we begin these next couple of hours, uh, where we fully expect to hear differing perspectives, I think it's appropriate to start with a couple of points that we might all agree on. The first of these has to be pride in our great nation and the institutions and values that we hold as the American people. We all believe in freedom and equality and the right to have and express our own individual thoughts. It's just exactly what we're doing here today. I think it's appropriate to recognize that this type of forum would not be possible in many parts of the world. We live in a world where ethnic and religious conflict abound and economic and geographic strife lead to daily bloodshed. Although our methods of popular consent and majority rule applied to political disagreement and conflict resolution may not be perfect, we do not resort to open warfare to solve our internal disputes. In fact, our meeting today is an important part of our political process. We're going to rationally and calmly discuss potentially controversial issues in a free and open environment. We need to be aware that our system of government and the combined determination and will of all generations of Americans create this climate and that it is a very precious thing, not shared by many, that we must cherish and preserve. A second area where I'm sure that we can find wide agreement is that none of us wants a war that would threaten to destroy our way of life. And since we are discussing state-of-the-art technology, we can especially underline that none of us wants a nuclear war. Certain, clearly, the destruction from such a conflict would forever alter the world as we know it. So what we must do is determine the best way to prevent such an event from occurring. This, I believe, drives our ethical determination of how best to use our technology. As you already know, I'm the president of Martin Marietta Astronautics Group in Denver, and a significant part of our business is in providing goods and services to the United States Department of Defense. Martin Marietta does, in fact, manufacture arms. The fact that we provide hardware for the Department of Defense is a source of great pride for all of us at Martin Marietta. We take very seriously the stewardship of taxpayer dollars and earnestly try to provide the very best of all possible products and services on every contract that we work. We apply research to meet the societal objective of national security and defense of the United States. We believe that this is ethically and morally the right thing to do. And our business responds to a nationwide popular mandate. The Constitution charges us to provide for the common defense. The continued leadership of a series of elected presidents backed by the continued support and direction of the Congress with their close annual scrutiny reflects that this is the collective will of the American people. We are proud of Martin Marietta's role in national defense and believe that the best way to maintain peace is through a strong military that will deter any potential aggressor. At the same time, we support our national leaders as they pursue significant, equitable, and verifiable reductions in force levels through arms control agreements and look for other ways to ensure our shores are never threatened. Political freedom and prosperity flourish best in a secure and peaceful environment, and we are committed to doing our part to maintain this environment for ourselves and for future generations. Over the past 40 years, we have learned that the best way to avoid war is through credible deterrence. 
The great paradox of our time has been that we have had to deploy modern nuclear weapons to keep from having to use them to protect our vital national security interests. We must be prepared to wage war so effectively that no opponent could rationally conclude that he stands to gain by initiating war, especially nuclear war. Now for a little more detail on why I believe that participation in the defense industry is both ethical and moral. As with any matter of conscience, this is a deeply personal issue and one that all of our engineers and researchers, not only at our company but in the defense industry as a whole, must come to grips with. All I can offer are my own views and tell you what has influenced me in the choices that I have made. First, it is, it is my strong belief that there is no more honorable profession than the defense of this nation and its constitution. After all, we are a nation created of the people, by the people, and for the people. And security, in my opinion, is the greatest social service that the United States government can provide for its people. The defense industry in this country in general, but Martin Marietta in particular, is a vitally important element of our nation's defense posture. And as I have mentioned, I'm proud to be associated with this effort. This pride, of course, flows from and depends upon our organization believing in and following all laws and regulations established by the United States government. I'm proud to be a supplier of arms for the United States, but I can tell you we will not sell arms simply to the highest bidder. All of our foreign sales, and we do engage in foreign military sales, are carefully controlled and we are in complete compliance with regulations established by the departments of state and defense and we intend to keep it exactly that way. In other words, I am basing my case for the ethics of arms manufacture on direct linkage to United States national security interests. Furthermore, if we're going to arm our troops and send them into battle, then I believe we must provide them with the best equipment and supplies that we can. To do less would be immoral. Take the Persian Gulf as perhaps the Persian Gulf conflict that has just happened in the last year as an example. It's clear that United States defense technology saved thousands of American lives in that conflict. And I must say that Martin Marietta products were used extensively and performed very, very well. An example is the Patriot missile. You saw on nightly television here a few months ago, scuds raining in regularly on Tel Aviv or Saudi Arabia. Those scuds were intercepted effectively by Patriot missiles assembled by Martin Marietta in Orlando. Similarly, the, the screens that you saw on TV that showed the night vision systems from our F-16 and F-15E fighters were built by Martin Marietta. Those night vision systems allowed our forces to fight at night very, very effectively. Similarly, the night vision system for the Apache helicopter is built by Martin Marietta. Point is that those modern technology, high-tech arms, indeed did save thousands of American lives in the Gulf. There are a number of other issues that are, that sort of touch this subject of the ethics of arms manufacture, and I'd like to just comment very, very briefly on a few of these, and then during our question and answer period, I'll have an opportunity, I hope, to engage in some more discussion with you on the subjects. But the first one I thought I'd talk about is, and I hear occasionally about, is the very special case of nuclear arms. Fact is that nuclear weapons are weapons of mass destruction, and so in some ways there's a special ethical or moral consideration that should be laid against those arms. Yes, Martin Marietta also does build intercontinental ballistic missiles, and so in that sense, we are in the nuclear arms business. The fact is, though, I believe that nuclear weapons since World War II have been developed and deployed strictly as a matter of deterrent force. We have deployed those nuclear weapons because we wanted to avoid having to use them and deter any aggressor from using nuclear weapons against us. Another argument that one occasionally comes uh, into contact with is that spending on defense diverts resources that would otherwise productively be used in the private economy. While I think there's some truth in that argument, I'll go back to the Constitution. 
which establishes one of the primary functions of our government to provide for the common defense. And then I'll quickly add also that a lot of the research and development technology that has been developed under defense contracting has indeed had spin-offs into our private economy. Perhaps the best example is the telecommunications business whose infrastructure really was spawned from defense technology. There have been a number of, of uh, widespread press uh, reports about abuses in the defense industry, and I'd be remiss if I didn't say a few words about that. The fact is that the defense industry is a highly regulated business. There are literally thousands of rules and regulations that apply to defense procurement. I believe that our defense industry has really focused on trying to train employees and, and educate employees on the subject of high ethical standards and professional conduct within our industry. It's true that we're highly audited as well. And so there have been some individuals working in the defense industry, and it is a big industry, that have, in essence, been guilty of unethical conduct. But I can assure you that Martin Marietta as a, as a corporation, and the defense industry in general, is dedicated to education and training of our employees to conduct themselves only with the highest of ethical standards. I would close these informal remarks and, as I say, look forward to some more uh, conversation during the uh, question and answer period, but I would close these remarks simply by saying that I think it's accurate to say that as a result of the hard work, the dedication of many hundreds of thousands of people, both in the military service and in our defense industry, coupled with the investment of our nation in a strong defense and det deterrent force, that collective effort has indeed allowed an entire continent to be set free. The events that have transpired here in the last few months are remarkable. I believe they were enabled by our strong peace through strength defense posture. I've enjoyed uh, uh, giving you these remarks and I'll look forward to more comment later. Thank you. Being here reminds me of the time when I was a graduate student at Harvard, and uh, we had a visit from the then candidate uh, for president, Adlai Stevenson, who had just been to MIT, and he said, uh, I was at MIT where I tried to humanize the scientists. Now that I'm at Harvard, I'll try to simonize the humanists. <laughs> um, I would uh, very much like to respond <coughs> to some of the things that Peter said, but I think what I'll do is uh, stick to my uh, text uh, so far as I can, and then save some comments on the uh, uh, for the subsequent discussion. Uh, uh, I uh, I want to divide my remarks into three parts, as uh, Caesar divided Gaul, right? Um, uh, first, with some reflections on engineering as a profession. Second, with what's happening to the weapons business now that the Cold War is virtually over. And third, how ethical considerations bear on the decisions uh, you will have to make in your careers. First, to discuss engineering as a profession, we need to begin by recognizing that all of us are identified to a considerable extent by our jobs. We are what we do. When people think about anyone, they often think about what he or she does for a living. So-and-so is a lawyer, a plumber, a businessman, professor, professional athlete. <clears throat> if you get through this place in one piece, you'll be known for the rest of your lives as uh, engineers. In addition, you may have a double life as a businessman or a teacher in some other capacity that makes use of your training. Except for some lighthearted ribbing, as in the movie The Revenge of the Nerds, engineering has always been a very prestigious activity in this country, more so than in Europe. There, until recently, it was looked down upon because it was a form of applied science and therefore less prestigious than pure science. And even so, pure science was thought inferior to the humanities. <clears throat> in this country, the humanities were weak even in the universities, and pure science came into its own only when uh, uh, Einstein and other European refugees, uh, in effect, brought it here with them. Well before then, we had a very proud tradition in engineering shaped by the Yankee tinkers, by certified engineers like Ben Franklin and uh, Benjamin Rittenhouse, Eli Whitney, Robert Fulton, Morse, uh, <clears throat> Edison, 
Roebling and Amon, who designed our wonderful bridges in the East, the Wright brothers, Henry Ford, uh, Langley, Charles Proteus Steinmetz. And then increasingly, our achievements in engineering became less those of individuals and more of groups, like the people who invented the transistor at Bell Labs, like the others at IBM, Texas Instruments, Eastman Kodak, uh, Bell, uh, uh, and, and the defense and aerospace companies, uh, in, the, in the skunk works, as they call them, at uh, Lockheed, Boeing, Rockwell, TRW, and Martin Marietta. Looking back <coughs> on um, uh, how prominent engineers have been in our society, it's not surprising that social theorists earlier in this century should have predicted the rise of technocracy. They supposed that engineers would actually become a new ruling class, maybe of the kind uh, that uh, Aldous Huxley imagined in Brave New World, where the slogan, uh, uh, well, where, the, where our Lord was going to be replaced by our Ford, and the slogan would be, Ford's in his flivver, all's right with the world. That prophecy began to recede once the first engineer was actually elected president of this country. Everybody, of course, knows who the first engineer was, who was president of the United States. Who was it? Herbert Hoover. Right. After that experience, we decided it really didn't make that much of a difference. We had another engineer, I guess you'd call him, that was Jimmy Carter, who was a nuclear engineer. Again, he didn't do quite well enough to have either party require an engineering degree for candidates for the presidency. <laughs> um, for the most part, political science majors who go on to become the lawyers still run the country with the occasional advice and consent of engineers. Now you know why we're in such trouble. Institutionally, too, this country has had a strong commitment to engineering almost from the start. West Point was created as a school for Army engineers. MIT was founded as an engineering school, not as a science school. All of the land-grant colleges were founded to promote animal husbandry and the mechanical arts, in the words of the Morrill Act. The reason, I suppose, <coughs> for this <coughs> strong engineering tradition is that this country has always been very pragmatic. And um, uh, uh, the, even though our humanistic intellectuals have tried to persuade us of the superiority of things of the spirit to machines, we haven't really believed them. For example, Ralph Waldo Emerson was probably the greatest American philosopher of the 19th century, maybe of all time. And when he was told that uh, Morris had made it possible for people in Maine to communicate with people in Texas by telegraphy, he asked the inevitable dumb humanities question, what would people in Maine have to say to people in Texas? <laughs> if it had been up to him, they would never have strung all that wire and left us with all those unsightly poles to ruin, ruin the landscape. In 1900, our leading intellectual was Henry Adams, and he was so impressed by a hall of dynamos at an exhibit in Washington that, like a true intellectual, he sat down to brood in his study and wrote an essay uh, about the conflict between the dynamo and the virgin. And by the virgin, he really had in mind the, uh, uh, the, the faith in Europe in the supernatural that had led to such great works of art. And he was contrasting the works of art he had seen in Europe with this exhibit of dynamos that seemed to him typical of America. And he reflected that uh, uh, perhaps the soulless American technological dynamo would win out over the European quest for transcendence. After all, was he wrong? There are plenty of dynamos around, but how many virgins? <laughs> but because there are dynamos, there are engineers. As of 1988, there were 3,074,500 employed in this country, according to the data. Uh, and I believe you have that on, your, uh, on the handouts that I've uh, given you, but let me put them here on the screen as well. Um, the, uh, uh, it, uh, of that uh, number, 2.84 million were employed. The rest apparently married money. Uh, and that's twice as many as there were in uh, 1978. The number would have leveled off, except that many foreign students came to study engineering here and have stayed on. The three largest categories, incidentally, are mechanical, electrical, or electronic, and, of course, other. Um, and just about 80% were employed in business and industry. Uh, 118,000 in educational institutions and others in government labs. The good news uh, for you as you worry about finding a job when you leave is that from 1976 to 86, the employment of scientists and engineers in industry increased by 8% a year in spite of recessions. The bad news is that some of that employment was provided by the defense industries, which experienced a boom from the last years of the Carter administration through the Reagan administration and are now about to experience a bust 
Uh, I don't have a breakdown of the number of engineers employed in defense work. The big eight uh, defense contractors, however, employ some 700,000 people alone, not all of them engineers, not all of them in defense work. Uh, but unless um, there is a shift to civil development and production as defense spending declines, there could be fewer opportunities for engineers overall than there have been in recent years. I just heard today an astonishing report that the General Accounting Office has found that uh, McDonnell Douglas is in such difficulties that it could close down. That I hardly expected. Some companies are likely to feel the defense cutbacks more than others. General Dynamics does 73 percent of its business just with the Department of Defense. Martin Marietta, 15 percent. GE, on the other hand, does only 11 percent. Boeing, 15. So these companies are diversified enough to weather the cutbacks without feeling too much of a pinch. Still, in absolute terms, the largest contractors are all vulnerable. GE, for example, uh, does 5.87 billion in, in prime contracts, or did in 1989, the third largest amount after McDonnell Douglas, uh, almost 9 billion, and General Dynamics 7.28. Now that gets me to the second part of my remarks, which might be called, whatever happened to the defense budget. From 1950 on, the defense budget rose because we uh, uh, adopted the strategy designed to contain the Soviet threat. And uh, uh, an awful lot of uh, uh, jobs, of course, are tied to defense uh, spending. And as the Soviet threat diminishes, uh, there will be a tendency, there already is uh, underway, a, uh, an effort to cut back on the uh, defense um, budget. The, from uh, a recent peak of 6.4% in 1985, it's due to fall by, to 3.8% by 1996. And uh, all of this is before the President's recent announcement uh, of uh, uh, unilateral cuts uh, and some negotiated cuts with the Soviets. And that is leading Congress to feel that the budget ought to be cut um, even more. And that means uh, that um, uh, procurement will fall almost 50 percent. Uh, and if you look at specific areas, shipbuilding 26 percent, aviation 23, research and development 23, uh, uh, and so on. Now, that may not all happen because, uh, for one thing, um, a lot, lot of congressmen are reluctant to close defense uh, facilities because entire communities are affected uh, by them. And in view of the unemployment we already have, there's bound to be particular reluctance on that. S but uh, uh, I would say the chances are that many of you will be uh, tempted to take jobs in the defense sector. And the question before you is, can you do that and still hang on to your soul? Now, that brings me to the third and final part of my remarks, the question of ethics um, and uh, arms manufacture. As you're probably aware, the word ethics uh, is one of many we owe to the ancient Greeks. It comes from the word ethos, which means roughly character or spirit. Naturally, the first philosopher to deal with the subject was a Greek philosopher, in this case Aristotle, uh, in his book, The Nicomachean Ethics, um, uh, named after his father. And in this work, he sets out to answer the question that's one of the most profound of all philosophic inquiries, certainly the one that concerns us most as individuals, which is simply what it means to live a good life. The conclusion that he came to is that meaning a good life, uh, that living a good life means being happy, but that happiness has to be understood not just in terms of pleasure, but in terms of what is right or just. And in order to think about what is just, we have to ask ourselves not simply what's good for us, but what's good for our friends, our society, for the world at large, and, and, and life. Uh, the Greeks were, of course, preoccupied with the life of the polis. Uh, they took nature as a malevolent force. Uh, in, in our day, we live in a very interdependent world, and we uh, have to be e even concerned about what happens to the environment. So ethics has, then as now has to do with the personal choices we must make for the sake not just of personal pleasure, but for the sake of uh, living justly. Um, a pacifist uh, would say that if you ask the question of whether arms manufacture contributes to uh, anything good, uh, the answer is obvious. War is not healthy for children and other living things, as the peace movement slogan had it years ago. Weapons are developed to kill. We'd be better off without them. So it follows it's not ethical to manufacture arms. Stop the manufacture and the arms race. We all live happily ever after. If we wouldn't develop new weapons, other countries wouldn't either. Now, the reason few people are pacifists is not that most of us are immoral, but that the pacifist answer would doom the innocent and encourage the aggressive. 
If we had followed, there are just wars, and if we had followed this advice 50 years ago, Hitler and Imperial Japan would have conquered the world by force of arms. Uh, Britain was saved from invasion, not just by the valor of the RAF pilots, but also by the radar they got in the nick of time from engineers like Robert Watson Watt. Had Hitler gotten the atomic bomb first, as the scientists who fled Europe feared, uh, the, uh, world, uh, the, the world order uh, that we would have now would be rather different from the one President Bush anticipates. Like it or not, Japan surrendered only after the atomic bomb was used against Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Those bombs may have saved even more lives than they took by, ma uh, by making an invasion of the Japanese home islands unnecessary, painful as it is to acknowledge that. That doesn't mean that those who designed and built these bombs didn't experience moral qualms. Before the atomic bomb was used, many of its creators tried to persuade the government not to use it, but to stage a demonstration uh, in some uninhabited area. It was found that that would be impractical. Afterward, Robert Oppenheimer said, we scientists have tasted sin, and he proved reluctant to work on the H-bomb because of moral doubts. Uh, his security clearance, as you know, was removed, and he was accused unjustly of treason. After that experience, some physicists refused to do war work of any kind. And the situation really only got better because an arrangement was created whereby they could provide policy advice to the President and Congress so they could take part in the process of decision making. At first, however, when that war was over, there was a temptation to close the labs and get back to business as usual. Then came the Cold War. Instead of dismantling our military procurement system, we revved it up again under Truman and since then. But note that President Eisenhower, in his farewell address, warned us about the dangers we were running. Uh, in, uh, he said that we were running the danger of having a military-industrial complex that might get too powerful and might even be run by a scientific technical elite. Now, why did President Eisenhower warn about that? Well, for one thing, um, the, uh, uh, the, the problem in our society often is that economic resources are used to influence policy. Defense firms spend a lot of money on lobbying and advertising to win contracts. Not only that, but there's a revolving door phenomenon. In the 1950s, more than 1,000 retired military personnel were hired by defense contractors. In the 60s, that went up to 2,000. The number is even higher in the decades since, despite laws to prevent it. Consider the scandals. Boeing admitted getting missile information from a Boeing employee in the Pentagon. GE, General Dynamic. Virtually all the military contractors have now been found guilty of similar corrupt practices. And now, Martin Marietta stands accused by former Assistant Secretary of the Navy, Paisley. How many congressmen have been bought and sold by defense contractors and their political action committee? What does it do to our representative system when congressmen become dependent for re-election on the contracts they get uh, from defense uh, contractors for their districts? Mendel Rivers got so many defense con facilities for his district in South Carolina that it was said that if he got one more, his district would sink. In the 1970s, when the President and the Secretary of Defense wanted to cut the B-1 bomber program, um, Rockwell urged its 115,000 employees and shareholders to write their congressmen. They rallied 3,000 subcontractors in 48 states. They spent $1.35 million for lobbying, and we got a plane that some of its critics call the Flying Edsel, and that certainly doesn't make sense if we also have the B-2. Certain regions of the country have become heavily dependent on military spending. On top of that, the politicians get to feel that there's a technological fix. You don't have to worry about negotiations and arms control. Uh, SDI is a classic example of the fallacy of the last move, the belief that you can make one more advance and that'll end the arms race. All that happens every time one of those moves is made is that the other side is forced to make a counter uh, move and uh, the, uh, things get worse and worse and more and more nuclear weapons pile up. There's an arms bazaar in the world. It's all very well to say we don't sell weapons to bad guys, but somebody does. Uh, the Chinese, the North Koreans, everybody else is still pumping arms into Iraq and uh, uh, Syria. And uh, now we're about to learn that virtually every country in peace-loving Switzerland, every company in peace-loving Switzerland probably helped Iraq get, uh, get, uh, uh, try to get nuclear weapons. So those are very serious problems, and they come from the fact that for whatever the good reasons, we do get overly committed to uh, a weapons uh, industry. Now, does that mean we shouldn't do it? I'm afraid not. 
The truth is, uh, uh, Western Europe and Japan would not be as stable and prosperous as they are if we hadn't provided them with a nuclear and strategic uh, shield. Uh, very likely, the Russians wouldn't have come to the decision they've come to, to abandon their command economy, if we hadn't uh, forced them to recognize they couldn't have both guns and butter. And uh, it's certainly correct to say uh, that uh, the weapons we had in Desert Storm saved an awful lot of lives. There's no doubt about that. And the world remains anarchic. So I don't think there's anything inherently immoral about uh, producing weapons. I do think, however, there are dangers. The historian Paul Kennedy has warned us we're in danger of repeating the British folly, or what he calls imperial overstretch, uh, uh, biting off more responsibilities than we can chew. Um, and the other thing is we live in a much more competitive world than we did at the start of World War, the uh, start of the Cold War. If you look at the patent picture, uh, our rivals who spend much less than we do on defense are, are just tromping us all over the place uh, in, in, in electronics and lots of other areas. And um, uh, there are reasons why we as a country have to think seriously about redeploying our uh, technical resources. I think Gore Vidal had it right when he said the U.S. and the USSR have a lot in common because nobody will buy a car made by either of us. <laughs> we need a strong defense, but we do not need a frantic quest for ever more exotic high-tech weaponry. And I therefore hope that as you make your choice of a career, as you face ethical dilemmas in deciding whether to promote some new military technology, you'll bear in mind your responsibilities as a citizen and not as just as somebody who loves to take apart old machinery and put it together as something new, whatever use it has. I don't think you'll be doing anything immoral mm -hmm. if you work for a defense company, necessarily. But if you are to behave ethically, you have to behave as a citizen of your country and of the world. And that t means taking other concerns into account. It may mean becoming a whistleblower when you find they're not using the right O-rings. It may mean uh, that uh, you, you should uh, fall, hold back before you promote a new technology that you know isn't really necessary and that will only perpetuate the arms race. Um, and it may mean, too, that you encourage your company to diversify so that it doesn't have a vested interest in perpetuating that uh, military competition. Thank you. This is rather strange for me that for some time, I would say several decades, I've <clears throat> been opposed to uh, militarism. That is not um, being opposed to being in the military or building defense weapons, but um, being opposed to the degree to which we do those things in this country. And I've had a rather marginal point of view, although that isn't to say I haven't always been right. I've always been right. It was just that not that many agreed with me. Uh, I, fe I feel a little odd now is because I think although <clears throat> my conclusions are probably um, moving to mainstream America's conclusions, um, I am reassured that both of the previous speakers um, still have made me feel as though I have somebody to disagree with. And so I will cling to my old positions for a while before I search some new marginal ground. The <clears throat> other comment I'd like to open with is that for me, ethics, I'm not particularly interested in discussing the morality of individual engineers. I would uh, sharply dissent from uh, the, I think I heard, an endorsement of whistleblowing. Um, be very careful. You'll sacrifice your career. You will sacrifice uh, your friendship. You might, friends that you have, um, and possibly your marriage too, and you'll find it very hard to get other work. Unless you pursue it through the Federal False Claims Act as amended in 1986, which allows you to blow the whistle on, federal, um, on companies that uh, are defrauding the federal government. That's about the only support for whistleblowing there is, and I would encourage you only to do it if you can use it. My view of ethics has more to do with social ethics and individual ethics. Um, there is, as far as I'm concerned, no such thing as engineering ethics. Um, it would have to be something more than the collective um, sum of all those uh, moralities of individual engineers. I'd encourage you to be as moral as you wish to in your private lives. I'm not suggesting that's not unimportant. I th I'm interested rather in the way in which we get a better society through technology and the role that policy play, uh, policy plays, the, the role that um, institutions play, organizations play, and uh, 
rewards and punishments play in the systems we set up to do that. With respect to the lives of engineers, uh, the metaphor that will govern what I have to say could be expressed in terms of fences and gardens. I think that uh, we have a neglected garden and a very large and sophisticated and unnecessary fence uh, for the sort of rabbits that are outside of the fence. And that will be my basic metaphor. I'll also suggest that although in this country we argue that, oh, we can't have an industrial policy, this is a free market economy, uh, lots of capitalist countries do have industrial policies, further, we have an industrial policy. We put roughly one third of all scientists and engineers <coughs> to work for defense. We have been putting two thirds of all federal R&D into defense. This happened during the 1980s at a time when uh, the e economic competitive of the United States was and continues to be in decline and we were putting nothing into R&D for manufacturing which is one of the places in which uh, we have been suffering a great deal. The <clears throat> cost of deploying our resources this way with this type of industrial policy, there are many costs. Defense products are unusual in the fact that uh, we're lucky if we don't use them. There was a wonderful photograph of some people who've been working, I think they're young men who've been uh, uh, on duty in, I think it was like an MX silo or something like that. And for me at least, I was looking at the photograph of them and, and uh, thinking, you know, every day they didn't really have anything to do, I'm glad, you know. There was no further impact on the economy. If as an engineer you go out and design a bridge, and that bridge is maintained, which it isn't always in this country. We have tens of thousands of bridges in, in a poor state of repair. If you go out, and, you've got the bridge there. People travel to and fro over that bridge, regardless of the jobs that were created when you first built the bridge. But now the bridge is there. People are going to work. They're going to shop. They're going to study further, develop the human capital of the country. These are knock on, this type of thing is a knock-on effect of, of, of that type of economic activity. You do generate jobs when you spend money in defense. You generate more jobs, uh, perhaps not always for engineers because uh, uh, defense spending is very labor-intensive for engineers and scientists, but you generate more jobs uh, when you spend it in the civilian sector. There is a rough uh, lay rough correlation, negative correlation, between the level of defense spending in an economy of, if you look at Japan, North America, and Western Europe, the level of defense spending and their economic growth. We have in this country uh, a failing infrastructure in many ways, transportation, water, sewer, waste, education. Uh, you read the reports daily in your paper through the 80s. There's lots of work there for people to be doing other than defense. Furthermore, we've <clears throat> been spending so highly on defense that there's a question of, uh, you know, your resource deployment that we cannot any longer uh, afford to do this. Let me just show you um, <clears throat> one of the things that happened. Maybe we could focus on this. It's a lousy graph, and I apologize for that. I pulled it out of a newspaper. If you can focus on that one. There it is. Uh, the year, you see how the drop in receipts went down. We called it supply side. It was actually um, a demand side economic policy where we cut taxes, pumped a lot more money uh, into the economy, uh, but we didn't pay for it. Uh, and this was at the same time we were engaging in a defense buildup. Well, I often teach to um, young people and I say, you know, that deficit has to be paid for. Um, who will pay for it? And I think if I ask the students here who will pay for it, they, they, you'll tell me, you will. Uh, you're going to pay for that. Already the uh, interest payments on the national debt have gone from something like, uh, I don't know, 6 or 7% of the uh, annual budget, federal budget, to something like 15 or 16%. These figures are tough because people keep moving things on or off the federal budget. For example, Social Security, they're trying to get onto the federal budget because it generates a surplus, and that surplus helps to reduce the deficit, but the deficit seems intent on growing faster uh, than the Social Security surplus. Okay. Well, 
you'd have to say, if we have other places to spend our money, like putting it into the civilian economy and rebuilding our infrastructure and encouraging civilian in industry, we would um, we'd really need to have a very good reason to be spending as much as we are on defense. Let's have a look at what we're spending on, on defense. This uh, information I got from the uh, Center for Defense Information, uh, Commander Ronald Fra Fraser, but it's also on a handout, which did everybody get that handout that you gave for me? I noticed a little graph there. <clears throat> and <clears throat> Fraser's idea was that, that if you look at the, the constant dollar analysis like this, and you can see there's a peak for World War II, the just war, uh, peak for Korea, uh, a sort of a bump for Vietnam, and some other bumps, and then another really big bump which goes higher than Vietnam. And there's no war. This is a military dividend. The Cold War spending base looks from this analysis as though it's somewhere be between 100 to 200 uh, billion dollars a year in 1990 do <coughs> uh, dollars. That that's roughly your spending base. Okay. So why did we engage in this increase in military expenditures um, at, oh, th during the 80s? And beginning in the, uh, it's true, in the, in the late 70s under, under Carter, where did this bump come from? Well, <clears throat> what was argued was that the Soviets were, there was a Soviet threat, a buildup of the Soviet threat. And this included things like George Bush, as head of CIA, putting out what was called the Team B analysis of the Soviet threat in, in somewhere in 75, 76, I don't know when that was. Uh, Team A wasn't good enough. That was a straightforward CIA analysis. So he went out and got the most conservative people in the country, put them on Team B, and then went with that analysis. It was things like that. It was also Casey and Gates. And there's a very revealing analysis going on right now about Casey and Gates and their attempt to, uh, to distort um, the, the intelligence um, that came out of the CIA. Very successful as well, obviously. Were we really in suffering? In hindsight, obviously, we weren't suffering from a Soviet threat. They, their economy was collapsing. Their economic growth stagnated. It had been higher than ours for some time. In the 50s, we talked about a dual gap, the, the missile gap. You know, they had the ICBMs, and they put up the Sputnik and so forth. They looked like they were getting ahead of us then on that and the and the growth gap their economy was growing faster at that time and people were projecting saying you know a few decades in the future maybe they'll they'll uh, pass us but they had stagnated in the in the 70s and uh, uh, and of course it collapsed in the in the, in the 80s <clears throat> in 82 for example McNamara said that at this time the Soviets are in a weaker position than they were 14 or 15 years ago and spending by the U.S. and its allies just prior to the buildup was significantly more than that of the Soviet bloc. In fact, it's always been higher, although the figures are a little bit tough because, uh, you know, in a command economy like the, the social Soviet economy, it's, it's a little hard to, uh, to translate into our uh, free market terms. The number of uh, divisions that they had, the Soviet bloc had 69 divisions in 1970. It was down to 46 uh, by, by 1980. Uh, our spending in real terms uh, from 75 to 80 went up by 10%. We had a third more strategic nuclear warheads. We had a, a submarine fleet that had, and still do, 2,700 nuclear weapons off the coast of the Soviet Union. Every Trident submarine out there can hit with a nuclear weapon every city in the Soviet Union. And we have, I don't know what we have, 40, 40 Trident submarines. That's in addition to everything else we have. We were not exactly uh, in any state of, of great <clears throat> peril. And incidentally, when we talk about defending this country, uh, I point out every year in the 1980s, we spent 160 to 170 billion dollars to defend countries in Europe, another 30, 40 billion to defend countries in Asia in 2040 to protect U.S. access to Persian Gulf oil. Okay. So it's not exactly defending our borders that, that we're doing. That's not what it's about. Now, one of the interesting things is this discussion of a peace dividend. Obviously, I think you have to get rid of the military dividend before you can have a peace dividend. After World War II, we, we, we had, I think it was, I uh, have this somewhere. 
75 percent, 30% of the GNP in, in, in World War II was, um, <clears throat> was devoted to, to, to the military, and it dropped immediately. If, you, if we get back to the, cur to the uh, graph that we have here, you see how steep the graph is there. It's pretty steep after Korea. It gets a little flatter after Vietnam. It's getting very flat now. And incidentally, um, Weinberger in the mid-'80s was predicting that at this point we would be close to $500 billion, billion a year on, on defense. I mean, that were the plans. Uh, and one of the things that went wrong in the, uh, de de defense, of course, during the 80s was they engaged in far more programs they could afford than they could afford. And as they've cut back, uh, they're stretching out a lot of programs, and the unit costs go very, very high. And nothing uh, is a better example of this than the B-2 stealth bomber designed to operate in a uh, late stages of the Holocaust to flutter over a dead and dying world looking for any sign of life not yet extinguished. This thing is subsonic. It uh, can't defend itself. It is detectable. And it costs close to a billion dollars a plane. And we have no real function for it. There's still an attempt to defend this, uh, this weapon. But this is the sort of thing that many engineers and many scientists, particularly aeronautical engineers, physicists, electrical engineers, this is how they spend their lives building MX missiles and V2 weapons and so forth, and doing it at very high incomes, of course. I mean, there's a, <clears throat> a great deal of vested interest from all the people who are employed uh, by, uh, by the, the, the defense industries. Let me also say that not only did we have a military dividend but that went up roughly, we went up about 50% at the level in constant dollars in our spending in the 80s above what it was in the 70s. But other certain types of categories went up much higher than that. There was an increase of 112% for procurement, 95% for military construction, 81% for research development and evaluation. Okay? So, <clears throat> A great deal of money went into exactly where the profits were, and profits got very high in, in defense industries. They were roughly double what they were in private industry. Obviously, you're tending to draw away a lot of your best talent when a lot of the highest paying jobs and the best profits are in defense. And this, is, again, I stress, is when our economic competitiveness was going downhill. So we've been paying a <clears throat> quite a cost. The profits were under Reagan went up to about 30% at a time when commercial manufacturers' profits were declining to around 10%. And as uh, the last speaker mentioned, uh, many of these contractors, of course, have, are under criminal investigation. Uh, by 1990, 25 out of the top 100 uh, had been found guilty of defrauding the government. A lot of money also during the 80s went into Wall Street, and we've seen uh, a similar sort of consequences there. Well, <clears throat> we have then a very high level of defense spending, and <clears throat> there are in alternative ways to go about um, our industrial po policy. One would be to have an affordable defense economy and have a spin-on economy where instead of the, the often mythical idea that defense spending generates um, spin-offs for uh, in industry and for the economy, although there are always some spin-offs, when you spend, you know, 100, 150 billion dollars a year on procurement, I mean, you're bound to get some spin-offs, beyond it's impossible not to. Uh, but it's a very expensive way to get those spin-offs. Uh, there are a number of leading um, policy analysts like Harvey Brooks and Lewis Branscombe, Branscombe who argue that you'd be better stimulating a very good, strong civilian industry and getting your products from there. And maybe you wouldn't have to spend quite so much for your spanners and your computer chips and your toilet seats and so forth. The case for economic conversion is, is um, <clears throat> a little tricky. This is the idea that we would convert our defense industry uh, into, into civilian production. It's hard to s say whether uh, that's necessarily a thing we, that we should do as a policy or not. And different people have, have different arguments about it. Clearly, we should encourage infrastructure development uh, at a federal level. But mostly, you know, you can cut your uh, defense spending, and uh, you could abolish defense spending, 
and it would just about balance the budget because we now have a deficit of about 300 billion a year. And incidentally, a large chunk of that is, of course, what we're um, spending on interest payments on debts incurred uh, by uh, the increase in defense spending that was not paid for by the revenues because we cut revenues. So <clears throat> we're really in a trap there that past defense spending is limiting our opportunities to spend on the civilian economy. We're in another sort of trap uh, that OMB introduced in the budget agreement last fall, uh, which said that any reduction in defense could not transfer into the domestic se sector. There are now three separate caps, international, domestic, and military. So if you save money in the military, you cannot have a peace dividend. That's the bottom line. And that's true until 1994 or until it's revoked by Congress, which some people are thinking of doing. Yeah. We, we also, of course, have <coughs> a great deal of activity going on in what could be called the defense of defense. The first thing is to fight to keep contracts. This is one strategy. Another is to get other federal contracts. Another is diversify find civilian markets, convert production, or, um, or simply uh, go out of business. There's intense lobbying by defense contractors. Uh, <clears throat> it's, it's a, there was one criticism, I think it was in the Heritage Foundation, about a plane, and I believe it was by McDonnell Douglas, and I, I can't find it quickly, but um, the, the money, the, the Heritage Foundation is a very conservative group, a think tank in Washington, and their um, <clears throat> If their support was actually cut um, by that company because they published an article that was critical of that particular thing. They have been engaging very intense lobbying. This is perfectly natural behavior for them. They're trying to defend what they have. Uh, they have made a series of proposals. A couple of years ago, they made a proposal they should um, become an economic policy body, which I think was a faux pas because it drew uh, uh, public attention to, to the fact that they're already um, or would have if it had been accepted, um, extremely significant player in our economic policy. They wanted to take over um, <clears throat> environmental research. This is one of the things they proposed, but, but earlier, you know, when they were talking about becoming economic policy, um, that they had suggested that environmental restrictions were, were hampering um, the economy. Now they decided that is one, one area they could go into. They want to triple the SDI budget, um, which, and the SDI is a, is a, is a as you probably know, is, um, is a very, very hard program to justify uh, technically. Uh, the scientists who've been polled are like 90% opposed to uh, the idea that it's viable at all. They want major land acquisitions out, out in, in the West. And it's also worth noting that they are talking about uh, base closings and troop cuts a lot more than they're talking about procurement cuts. And on base closings, I would notice, however, that um, this is not necessarily a bad thing. They, I think it's the Office of Economic Adjustment and the Department of Defense reckon that uh, of 97 closed installations that of the 93,000 lost civilian jobs, they've been replaced by more than 158,000 non-military related jobs. 75 of these bases have industrial parks, 42 municipal airports, over 100,000 students in educational institutions that have been set up there. Okay. Well, <clears throat> I'd like to just close by commenting that, um, that the process uh, is not always rational. There's not always a, a collective will there that's represented. In the late 70s, and as Reagan came into power, uh, he had a plurality in support of a defense buildup, although I think that was um, uh, generated through the media uh, uh, in, a, in a not what I would call rational way. And, but by the mid-80s, that support had gone, but, but the defense level of defense spending only crept down very slowly. So <clears throat> what is worth noting, although there's a tremendous amount of investment uh, that politicians have in supporting industries and jobs in their various districts, most congressional districts actually are paying more in federal taxes uh, than they receive in, in federal defense 
spending. They pay more for defense. They've got, they've got an outflow there. And so politically, you know, there should be a, a dynamic there to try to bring these uh, expenditures down. And I believe, like William Kaufman of the uh, Brookings Institution, that the defense spending could very reasonably be down around the $150, $160 billion a year level. That would give us some opportunity to, to get the deficit under control and also to do some alternative spending, which would affect the way that engineers spend their lives and their careers and the types of things that they do. Thank you. Before I open the discussion to the floor, I would like to give our panelists an opportunity to speak to each other, uh, unless they prefer to respond to, to stimulation to the floor, but I imagine that they have things at the tip of their tongue. Yeah, I sure do. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to comment briefly on uh, several of the, the items that uh, both Richard and Sandy talked about, and um, I, I guess the first thing is I'll pick up on Richard's metaphor here of uh, uh, the garden. and. Uh, just simply say that uh, defense spending in this country uh, uh, in recent years is roughly 5% of our gross national product. And so this enormous cost of production, uh, for every 20 carrots grown in that garden, we're going to take one carrot and build the fence to protect ourselves. Uh, I would come back and say to you that uh, I think that's a pretty reasonable uh, kind of an expenditure given the process that we go through. Now, I, I also want to quickly come to this issue of the Soviet Union not being a threat. Uh, don't kid yourselves about the Soviet Union not being a threat. It is true that they uh, are in political turmoil. It is true that uh, their private economy has been decimated. But it's also true they have 10,000 very accurate nuclear warheads aimed at this country. And uh, I would just hasten to say that uh, I, well, let me pick up on something that, that Defense Secretary Cheney used in a speech here about uh, two weeks ago. Uh, he was talking about his quandary of what should he be proposing now in light of these world events, what should he be, be proposing for a defense budget? And the point that he tried to make was, look, if you go back to look at what happened in the Persian Gulf War. We used a lot of F-111 bombers. We used a lot of uh, cruise missiles whose technology was developed 15 years ago. The lead time on technology for major weapon systems is, you can argue it, but it's 15 years maybe, possibly even 20 years uh, from the time that uh, the research is initially done on a new weapon system until it's actually deployed and available for our forces. Now, given, and in that kind of a context, Secretary Cheney would then ask, now, would you like me to establish our defense budget on August 17th when Gorbachev was in full power and there were the 10,000 nuclear weapons aimed at our country? Or should I do that on August 20th when the coup was effective and the, Gorbachev was locked up somewhere and uh, some other nuts were in charge? Or should I wait until the 25th when Gorbachev, we think, is sort of in power? So I guess the point I'm trying to make is I think our responsible leadership, our government, needs to wrestle through this issue of what is enough defense. And we have a, a method and a technique set up to do exactly that. I admire President Bush for what he said. He, he announced last uh, Friday evening a dramatic change in our doctrine of defense that we have used for 40 years successfully, I might add, in deterring any kind of a nuclear war. So I think we ought to give our leadership in, in government a chance to respond, and the Congress a chance to respond, and debate what an appropriate level of defense spending should be. I want just two more quick points, and then I'll give others a chance. But uh, I want to come back on this issue that Richard talked about a little bit. Uh, with respect to profits in the defense industry, and I couldn't get straight on 30 percent for defense and 10 percent for everybody else, but I'll just cut to a bottom line. And you can think about this um, however you, you might like, but if you look at a market valuation of defense contractor profitability, you might look at what are defense industry stocks selling for. 
And one way to value stocks is to look at price to earnings ratios. I'm sure many of you have, have gone through that kind of an analysis. You'll find defense industry stocks listed on the New York Stock Exchange, Martin Marietta in particular, selling at about seven times projected 1991 earnings. If you look at the standard and poor industrial average, you'll find just a tad under 20 to 1 price to earnings ratios. So what I'm saying is our free market looks at defense stocks as about one third of the profit potential of commercial business. And this isn't something that's changed dramatically over these uh, last few years of uh, Reagan buildup. Defense industry stocks have typically sold at lower price to earnings ratios on a free market enterprise basis than commercial industrial enterprise. And the fact is defense industry stocks by most measures of profitability like percentage to sales, like return uh, uh, to shareholders in the form of dividends, etc. Defense industry stocks have not performed as well as uh, normal commercial companies. And so I just simply say this idea of defense contractors having high or exorbitant pro profits is a lot of baloney. Last item I just want to touch on real quickly, because I feel so strongly about it, is um, the business of the Strategic Defense Initiative. You know, for uh, 40 years in the post-World War II uh, era, when um, the nuclear buildup was going on on our side and on the Soviet Union side as well, we in the Soviet Union engaged in this doctrine of mutual assured destruction, wherein we both essentially agreed that neither side would have a defense against ballistic missile attack. That namely, if anybody started a war, it would be to no avail because the retaliatory force was there uh, to preclude the initiation of the war at all. President Reagan had the idea in mind that this mutual assured destruction, this mad strategic doctrine, was a wrong idea. And so he challenged the defense industry and the scientific community in this country, isn't there a better way? Couldn't we have a defense against ballistic missile attack? Couldn't we do research and technology development that would give us a shield against that kind of attack? Now, again, you can debate the merit of uh, whether or not it's possible to come up with uh, such a, uh, a system to provide defense against ballistic missile attack. But I'll say, in this last year, we've all seen on television, Patriot air defense missiles can knock scuds right out of the sky. Yes, that's a relatively easy problem. That is a much easier problem than a Mach 19 warhead coming in on an ICBM. But that doesn't mean that research and technology on an advanced strategic defense initiative system won't pay big dividends. President Bush is now strongly supporting an initiative, a, a part of the strategic defense initiative called Global Protection Against Limited Strike. And for darn good reason. The ICBMs are proliferating around the world. So are nuclear weapons. You probably heard on the radio today. Iraq was months, certainly less than a year away from having a surface-to-surface -surface missile and having a nuclear warhead capability. Gaddafi's already made the statement if he had a nuclear weapon, he would point it at New York City and, and shoot it. And I'll just say that at, in today's world, because we had adopted the Mutual Assured Destruction philosophy and signed an anti-ballistic missile treaty, we have no defense against ballistic missile attack in this country. There are no patriots deployed around Boulder, Colorado, and if there were, they would be defenseless against a Mach 19 warhead coming in. So I, I guess I'll say that there are a lot of ways of viewing the Strategic Defense Initiative. I view it very, very strongly in support. And that takes me to the last point I want to make, and that has to do with this business of lobbying. Uh, Sandy mentioned uh, these tremendous defense contractor uh, lobbying efforts and so on and so forth. I want to just try and put that into perspective for you. I serve on our PAC board, our Political Action Committee board. The employees of Martin Marietta, uh, on a per year basis, roughly speaking, contribute about $200,000 to a political action committee, which we do indeed use to make contributions to uh, political candidates. 
On the other hand, these same 65,000 employees of Martin Marietta donate over $4 million to United Ways around the country. And I will say that with respect to the, the donations that we make from our political action committee, we're talking about $1,000, $2,000 typically to a senatorial race, $500, $600 in a uh, congressional race. And there's only one reason why one criteria that we use to make those contributions. It is we would like to have access to the candidate. And why do we want access? For five or six hundred dollars, you can't possibly buy a vote in Congress. All you can hope to do is have enough access so you can put forth your point, your point of view, the American system way of operating, namely explain to the congressman some of the aspects, be they technical or be they political, surrounding particular weapon system involvement. So with that, I'll stop. Thank you very much. Can I just go next? Uh, you know, uh, I'm, I'm forced to say, I guess if you sit in the middle, you disagree with both sides. Um, the, you could agree with both sides. <laughs> yes, and there are some points on which I agree with both sides. But you know, the, the last heartfelt uh, outburst uh, by Peter made me think of Mr. Keating's remarks about uh, uh, why congressmen got money from savings and loans companies. Uh, unfortunately, we all have to uh, recognize that this is a lousy system, and it is corrupting the political process. And it isn't just the PACs. It's also the fact that uh, when industries become such dominant economic forces in their communities, Everybody, the trade unions, the representatives, are loath to give them up, whether they are bad for the country or not. They just become too vital for some local constituency. And, and we just have, if we're talking about ethics today, then we have to start thinking in, ter in broader terms. But, but uh, uh, so I, I disagree with him on that. And I, I certainly disagree with him on the Strategic Defense Initiative. And let me take a few minutes, if I may, to say why. Uh, it's difficult to confine myself to a few minutes having spent three or four years working on a book on the subject. But uh, first, first, I do want to say he mentioned openness earlier. And we benefited enormously in writing that book by the openness of people in industry and in the laboratories in the Strategic Defense Initiative Organization. Uh, Congress functioned magnificently. In many ways, this was a remarkable tribute to the American system. The tribute was that Reagan didn't get away with uh, SDI. Now, uh, uh, Peter mentioned that Reagan challenged industry to do something they uh, hadn't been able to do. The truth of the matter is, as he knows, that the Defense Department was sponsoring all sorts of research on exotic weapons of all sorts before uh, SDI was announced. We anticipated spending $14 billion. Reagan wanted to raise it to $26 billion. We wound up spending $18 billion in that uh, time. Reagan called for a defense that would protect us against nuclear weapons to such an extent that they would become impotent and obsolete. In other words, a total defense. And that's what people said was an absurd expectation. And when I say people, I'm talking about a committee of the American Physics Society, and I'm talking about all sorts of reputable scientists and engineers, including many in the laboratories that work on these problems. What we have now, what President Bush is urging, is not the Reagan SDI. It's SDI 2 or 3 or 4. In other words, GPAL's global protection is designed against limited strikes. Uh, uh, it might intercept maybe uh, you know, 10 percent or less of the Soviet missile force. And ask yourself this question. Uh, if we put up that, uh, that shield in space, is that going to be the end of it? Or aren't other countries going to try to uh, undercut that shield? Aren't they going to develop long-range bombers to get in under the nuclear shield? Or aren't they going to just think about uh, sending ships loaded with nuclear weapons into our ports? They could even smuggle uh, small nuclear weapons in bales of marijuana. Mm -hmm. We can intercept them across our border even without nuclear weapons. <laughs> uh, so the idea that we are going to somehow defend against uh, Gaddafi by uh, going into space and not even thinking about the rest of the consequences is very dangerous. Senator Nunn is, fa is in favor of something else, which is a limited strike based on ground-based missiles. And, and Mr. Teets uh, didn't mention that, the, that we were not uh, defenseless 
by, by agreement. If we wanted to, we could have deployed 100 ground-based uh, uh, launchers because the ABM treaty allows us to do that. The Russians did deploy them around Moscow, and we could still deploy them around Colorado or Washington or any place else. So, but, but let's not kid ourselves. Uh, it wasn't that we, were, we agreed to uh, 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 get mutual assured destruction. There was no defense against nuclear weapons, and there still is no defense against a massive assault with nuclear weapons. And the more we get involved with the arms bazaar, the more excuses we give to other countries to develop their weapons, to sell them to people like Gaddafi. Surely it's time now that the Cold War is over to cooperate with the Russians and with our allies in really doing something about nuclear proliferation and about the sale of missile technology uh, so that we don't have to uh, build these defenses that really can't defend us. One minor rebuttal, if I may, um, and that is just to get right at the SDI uh, kind of an argument. Uh, I would say that it is true that serious study, serious analysis, serious technology development would result in a strategic defense initiative that does have multi-layers. It will have a layer of ground-based interceptor that Senator Nunn is in favor of, but it will also have a space-based layer of uh, uh, defense, something that's currently being developed by Martin Marietta, as a matter of fact, called Brilliant Pebbles. And I, I, I maintain that if you just put yourself in the position of the citizens of Tel Aviv and ask yourself, how, how much terror is created when a ballistic missile is aimed at your city and it's coming in and you know it's coming in, you can see it coming in if you have no defense against it. Sandy's right in that, yes, in the ABM treaty, we had an opportunity to deploy 100 ground-based interceptors. 100 ground-based interceptors couldn't hardly defend a, a Minuteman field in North Dakota, let alone our major population centers. We in this country are defenseless against ballistic missile attack, and there's no reason for that to be the case. One um, small rebuttal. <laughs> I was going to do it And that you. is, uh, I, I appreciate his concern for the people of Tel Aviv. I share that concern. Uh, but I would urge him to recognize that Brilliant Pebbles won't intercept a single mm -hmm. uh, redesigned uh, Scud missile that can easily go in, and certainly not a Tomahawk cruise missile, that goes in below uh, the Brilliant Pebble shield. They're dunces when it comes to that kind well, of interception. Well, you need multi-layer defense. Well, okay. Um, can we just take it as read that I agree with um, Sanford's remarks? <laughs> <laughs> that offense always overwhelms defense. That's the name of the game in uh, the arms race, and that the ABM treaty was the one place in which we'd managed to stabilize the arms race uh, and quite, quite early. If we had got, could develop a workable system, uh, it would be terrifying for the, um, for the Soviets, or would have been when the arms race was on, because it would have meant uh, that we could have done a first strike and they'd be so weakened that our SDI would have been sufficient to um, deflect their reply response. And that's why the Soviets have been so worried about that. But uh, let's, uh, and as for the, the future possible uses of it, I, I, I can't see that at all. As Sanford said, there's so many ways in which you can get a nuclear device across the borders of a country, the thing to do is to eliminate the production of them. And that would take me back to 1945, and uh, I think it was when we took the Baruch plan to the UN, which said, let's not have any nuclear weapons in this world except the ones that we have. And Gromyko, I believe it was, went for the Soviet Union, said, let's not anybody have any nuclear weapons, and we said no. And the arms race began there. Uh, I would also like to comment on the uh, idea of technology saving uh, lives. Uh, it was very pointed that the lives they saved were American lives. Uh, of course, there are also the lives that are taken by the weapons of war. And in the case of Iraq, most of those lives went uh, to um, the dumb weapons, the dumb bombs. Before that war took place, one of the analysts said of the four to 500,000 Iraqis dug in in Kuwait and nearby, that this will either be the biggest graveyard or the biggest concentration camp in history. We don't know how many people died there. We do know they were largely the, um, the 
the oppressed minorities, the Shiites and the Kurds who were killed. One uh, analysis based on past wars and the amount of tonnage dropped, which was enormous, has calculated that it was probably over 300,000 Iraqis died. That was in the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists in, in May of this year. You can check the analysis and you can argue with them if you wish. So I think we should remember when we develop these weapons, um, even if it does protect our lives in some way, although it only does if you take your troops out there to fight the war. Uh, and also, if you do fight a war, you know, what do you gain by fighting the war? What did we gain by fight fighting Iraq and defeating Iraq? I think it was a political failure. It was a great military victory, but a political failure in terms of all we did was to reinforce whimsical lines drawn by colonial powers. We didn't even liberate the Kurds. We could have done that. We didn't defeat Saddam Hussein. We could have done that. We liberated Kuwait, which is a... I don't know, most Kuwaitis haven't even bothered to go back. They left in their Mercedes. They're still they're sitting around the coffee houses of Europe and North America. I mean, you know, they, they, they don't practice um, democracy. Uh, maybe it's nice to give them their, their, their boundaries back. But let's face it, what we like about the Middle East is not just the oil supply, which we control anyway through the Seven Sisters, the big oil corporations, but the supply of oil dollars. Kuwait, for example, earns more money from its investments and they're based in the Western, well, they're based in England, actually, but um, than they do from their oil, okay? Now, Japan and West Germany weren't very interested in supporting the war because they don't need that supply of, of petrodollars in their economies. The British and the Americans were very keen about it, and it wasn't the oil, it was, it was the money. That was, a, that was a major reason for, for going in there. So the causes of war and the costs that maybe other people pay, even if we don't, I think are worth bearing in mind. Thank you very much. Uh, I think our panelists will now entertain questions from the floor. Go ahead. Um, I, Please speak into the mic if you can. Um, I understand that um, that the uh, 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 success of the Patriot missile in uh, Iraq in the war was uh, apparently based on uh, its ability to intercept the actual missile and not the warhead. Um, and I understand that uh, out of like 40 some or 50 some SCUDs launched, uh, the uh, Patriot missile intercepted like 90 some percent of the missiles and about a few percent, less than 10 percent of the actual warheads and the warheads, the remaining warheads continued on and hit their target. Is that correct? Uh, yeah, I think that's very that's that's close to being very accurate. And um, I'll just say that Patriot, uh, while it, it did its job, and by the way, when you, when you take out that missile, then the warhead falls in the wrong place. I mean, uh, if you take the missile, the sooner you can get the missile out, the better off you are. And theoretically, you'd like to get the missile uh, a few seconds after liftoff. Uh, then that warhead would come right back down on whoever decided to to launch it in the first place. But nonetheless, just just to try and uh, put it into perspective. The Patriot is a uh, rather crude air defense missile, and uh, it was designed for anti-aircraft, uh, anti-helicopter uh, kind of action in Europe. And there was a special mod put in that would allow the air defense radar and uh, the sophisticated uh, necessary guidance system modifications to be made that would allow it uh, to be effective against SCUDs. When, when the Persian Gulf War started, uh, there were at most a handful of patriots capable of taking scuds out. Uh, our plant in Orlando, Florida, went around the clock, by the way, with a lot of union support and a tremendous outpouring of employee support, went around the clock all through the Christmas time frame, all throughout the whole holiday season in order to get enough s patriot missiles to, to defend Tel Aviv and Saudi Arabia. They were taking Patriot missiles out of Orlando, shipping them straight to Patrick Air Force Base, and within literally a few days from final assembly, they were in the batteries over outside of Tel Aviv. So I, I guess the point of all that, just to say, um, there are better systems available today. Under development right now is one major strategic defense initiative program called the Ground-Based Interceptor, GBI, which will have a tremendously improved capability over what the Patriot has, but the Patriot served as well. What 
What is ethically wrong with military officers who are experienced in, in systems taking jobs with defense contractors? Uh, I think, uh, since I raised this issue, let me comment on it. I think that uh, the, what's wrong with it uh, is that uh, uh, very often they uh, use undue influence. They have old, there's an old boy network, a buddy system, if you like, among procurement officers. And uh, first of all, they give contractors uh, preference. Secondly, they can easily find out about uh, requirements in, uh, for new technologies. And thirdly, those two are, are, are ethical sins, but there's a policy sin too. And that is that because of the expectation that once you leave your job in some procurement agency of the government, you can get a job in defense industry, you're naturally inclined to want to do business with the defense contractor. So what's set up is what somebody has called an iron triangle involving the defense industries, the military uh, services, and Congress. And, and the revolving door business, the fact that military officers uh, so often, when they leave their jobs, get involved with defense contracting, only makes that iron triangle uh, tighter still. Uh, it, it, you know, it, there may be some justification for it, but restrictions have to be put on it so that it doesn't function uh, in the corrupt uh, and, and uh, corrupt ways that I, I think are, have been pointed out and that led President Eisenhower, himself a military man, to warn against the military-industrial complex. I'll just say that uh, uh, on, on that topic, that um, regulations within uh, the military services are extremely tight with respect to uh, what retired uh, service people can do when they go to work for industry uh, and, and what companies they can join and under what conditions they can join. And uh, there is the potential here for a conflict of interest and I think that's a, a potential that has been well recognized by the Department of Fen Defense and appropriate rules and regulations put into effect. For example, and I'll just give you an, an example, if uh, uh, a person in the, the military has been involved with procurement of uh, any uh, system that Martin Marietta builds, then that officer cannot be involved in, in any aspect of our procurement uh, side or our business development or marketing or any of that kind of activity. Now, a former chairman of Martin Marietta once did make the statement that we do require qualifications on a lot of, uh, uh, for a lot of the jobs that we offer uh, to people. One thing we will not hold against someone is dedicated service to his country. I'd like to ask all three panelists to comment on this. Uh, the entire rationale, of course, for the defense, which we can all believe in, is to protect the United States. I'd last like to ask all three, who are potential aggressors who are a threat to the United States? I understand we have the uh, largest uh, amount of weapons uh, by many times of uh, other countries, and now that Russia is, while they still have their missiles, they are certainly not in a position to be the threat that they used to be. Who are these potential aggressors, and uh, what do you think about the balance between the amount of money spent, forget the percentage, uh, on defense when we have, for the last 12 years, um, the lower third of the population has lost about 10 to 12 percent of its income and the poverty rate keeps rising. Thank you. Uh, let me respond first because you combined a point of view with a question and it's a point of view that I, I agree with. So uh, I, I think it's clear that the I don't believe that we had any justification for moving the level of defense expenditure up to the level we have. Um, there's no sense in which it seems to me it, it enhanced the security, it seems to me it enhanced the insecurity of the world uh, when you engage in that sort of proliferation of, 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 of weapons. Um, now we clearly the uh, nuclear potential of the Soviet Union has not dis uh, disappeared. But there, it's being cut back. There, um, the political impetus behind that nuclear weaponry has largely gone. We're concerned, obviously, about the fact um, 
that the Soviet Union is breaking up into separate republics, uh, three of which have some nuclear um, weapons on, on their soil. And that's why President Bush, um, almost unprecedented, actually took unilateral action to get rid of some weapons. We've almost never done that. We've always been ahead of the game in the arms race. and. Um, to the extent that there's never been a time, I think, when, when our military leadership would have swapped uh, what we had for what the, the Soviets had, um, which is the key question. And, and so I don't know what it is and whether uh, we would pursue uh, stability and peace better through other means. Clearly, we, could, uh, we have absolutely no need to continue a strategic weapons development like upping, um, upgrading the Trident um, submarine and that, that weapon system, uh, things like the B-2 um, uh, and the any, any development of, of, of our ICBMs and so forth. There's absolutely no need. There is no enemy. But if, as you say, um, that's, your, that's what you think is what I think also. So. Uh, I uh, uh, would say that uh, I, am, I am sympathetic to the idea that we ought to be reducing our uh, military expenditures precisely because this, the, the Soviet threat, whatever may have been true in the past, is certainly a much diminished threat these days. On the other hand, uh, uh, I disagree with the observation that, the, uh, uh, that our action in the Persian Gulf was unwarranted or uh, uh, ineffective. On the contrary, I think it marks a major turning point in world history. We're finally making up for the great failure of the League of Nations by practicing collective security. This was not a unilateral American action. This was a United Nations action. Uh, granted that we had a very keen interest, and in not just our own interest, but that of the Western Alliance, in making sure of our access to oil supplies. But uh, the fact is that we are the leader of uh, the Western Alliance. People look to us for protection. If we were to abandon our commitment to Europe right now, there would be hell to pay. The Germans might have to become a nuclear power. The French would be uh, up in arms, so to speak. They might have to increase their budget. Uh, things are much better if we remain the head of the alliance. The same is true for Japan. Japan has been able to function under the American nuclear shield. If we give up that shield entirely, uh, then we, we risk watching Japan reemerge as a military power. Uh, you ask if what enemies we have. I admit that things are changing so dramatically that uh, I sometimes get a little skeptical on this point. The other day I listened on C-SPAN as somebody testifying in Congress tried to argue that there were going to be all these nations that were going to have nuclear weapons and delivery systems, and one of them was Brazil. So presumably we have to worry about Brazil because not of oil but of coffee now. Uh, but So that may be ludicrous. But on the other hand, it's not ludicrous to think that North Korea uh, may still attack South Korea. And it's not ludicrous to think that the Middle East is still a very unstable uh, place of the part of the world, and that China is still not de uh, decided on what path it's to take. So reluctantly, I'm forced to concede that uh, we can't really afford to become uh, a, an isolated uh, uh, Pacific uh, peaceful power entirely. I hope increasingly, however, we will work as we did in the Gulf crisis in terms of collective security and that more of the burden will be shared with our allies so that we don't have to suffer the effects of this overly heavy military expenditure. Can I just have a quick response? Um, the suggestion has not been made that we should have no uh, defense. The suggestion that I've made is that we could go down and see what $150 billion a year might buy us in defense and who would it be in the world who would challenge us when we're spending at that level? Number two, just a minor point, Brazil has abandoned its nuclear program. I would, uh, I would agree with the point that uh, our, our defense posture, our defense spending, should absolutely be correlated with the threat that we're, we're faced with. And for that reason, I certainly applaud President Bush for uh, the innovation that he showed the other night by by talking about stopping uh, and and rolling back the clock on a significant number of of nuclear weapons. In addition to that, and I don't know if you're aware of this or not, but each of our each branch of our armed forces 
are currently undergoing significant downsizing activities. Um, we'll go from 14 carrier battle groups down to uh, eight or nine in that uh, ballpark uh, in, in a relatively rapid fashion. Our 750,000 man United States Air Force will be a 425,000 man force in the matter of the next uh, two to three years. 34 tactical fighter wings will go to 24. I, what I'm saying is on a very significant and broad front, the United States military is downsizing in response to a decreased threat in the world. And uh, I guess the process that we've established for deciding how to do that is one that involves uh, uh, a judgment by the administration that's based on intelligence collection from a lot of different points of view. It involves a congressional debate that uh, takes place on an annual basis and right now the Congress is debating uh, the defense budget. So uh, there's a lot of input into that process and there are a lot of ca uh, complicated factors surrounding it. But I, I guess I'm just trying to say is yes, I agree with you that our defense posture should match the threat. We are in fact facing a smaller threat and we're doing so with a smaller military force. <clears throat> I still believe, and just one last quick thought, I still believe that the important thing, and it kind of relates to what you all are doing here at the University of Colorado, um, we need to be on the high-tech end of the weapons that are under development. I just, I, I, I can't imagine what our response in the Persian Gulf War would have been if we'd have had the same kind of antiquated weapons that Iraq had. It, it would have been a sorry, sorry state of affairs. And if we stop our research and development, if we stop our technology push, that could easily happen. Other countries around the world are not going to stop technology development in arms, and we ought to be vigorously supporting research and development in arms manufacture. How much do you think we should be spending every year? Pardon me? How much should uh, Mr. We be Teets, spending? how much do you think we should be spending every year? Well, I must say that uh, I would follow the lead of President Bush. This year he's asking for a $295 billion uh, defense budget. He will look at those needs, and Secretary Cheney will evaluate the threat and provide inputs to him. It'll be rapidly decreasing over this uh, five-year period that uh, the Department of Defense is currently doing its budget planning for. But I would say that the President is in an awfully strong position to be able to try and best understand the threat that faces the United States and to best respond to it to the very, very best of his ability. So I'd, I'd follow President Bush's lead. With or without Robert Gates. <laughs> <laughs> I have two questions. One's, the first one specifically to Mr. Teets, and the other one just as a general question. Uh, I could have misheard, but it sounds like when you were discussing your political action campaign for Martin Marietta, that that group gives only $500 to a congressional candidate or an incumbent. If this is true, how many times do you give this $500? Uh, it seems remarkably small. And the second question is, given that America has such a, a wide variety and uh, high technical level of weapons, how do these weapons affect their determination uh, for negotiation or um, diplomacy in tense situations? It appears that it does. I'd like to get your opinion, though. Tr second question again, please. I'm not sure I understood the question. If our weapons that we have are uh, against another possible enemy are very superior, you know, guaranteed to work, and the number is very large, would that affect our determination to negotiate any uh, difficult situation? Where we might be more apt to use these weapons than to go with the longer effort I to negotiate around it. Well, I, I suppose there's some risk in that, and I'll try and answer the second one first and then get back to your first question there. But uh, I'll just say, if you look at the events in the last couple of days, uh, the President seems very reluctant to go into uh, Haiti. On the other hand, or to send any military force to Haiti. On the other hand, he's strongly uh, in support of uh, the incumbent President. And so, um, again, I think you have to rely upon leadership. It isn't the technology, it isn't the weapons that are available. I, I, those are there as tools to be used in the event the President decides that the situation warrants their usage. And it kind of goes back to, to what I said earlier. I know it sounds a little bit uh, on the emotional side, but uh, 
the fact is, if we're going to send our troops into battle, I, I sincerely believe that to do anything less than give them the best equipment that we possibly can is an immoral act. Now, let me get back to your question on the PAC. Um, uh, we operate our PAC in very, very strict compliance with uh, the rules and regulations that are set up to govern PACs. Um, uh, matter of fact, our general counsel uh, of Martin Marietta Corporation also sits on the PAC for that very reason. We, we don't want to make any, any even minor uh, paperwork or anything else kind of a mistake. I mentioned to you that, that our PAC uh, in a typical congressional election cycle will raise about $200,000 from employees of Martin Marietta. This is not corporate profits. The, this is not a corporate uh, kind of a donation by any stretch. These are private individuals who have decided to donate to the political action committee. And typically what can happen is uh, we will consider a request for contributions in a primary election and in, a, and in a, a general election. And in the congressional races, typically speaking, $500, $600, dollars $1,000 is a large donation from our political action committee. Now, I'm not speaking f for the large PACs. We're not a large PAC. Um, for a senatorial race, typically speaking, our uh, donations will be in the two to three to $4,000 range. I think we, uh, well, I, all of our donations are a matter of public record as well. So uh, you, you can get that information. It's, it is publicly available. And you'll find that those are the roughly the kinds of uh, dollars that we're talking about. But now maybe uh, Sandy or, or Richard would like to answer the uh, second question. Uh, yes, I, I, I would like to say one thing about it. And that is that there is something to your, your concern about whether, if weapons exist, you'll be tempted to use them rather than negotiate. In deterrence theory, there's even a concept of compellence, which means that if you can take advantage of a perceived superiority, you can have your way. And uh, uh, a student of mine took part in uh, Operation Desert uh, Storm and came back and told me yesterday that the, uh, the weapons did function superbly, and he was very grateful to have them. Uh, but he lost two of his buddies at Kafji. And uh, he still wonders whether the war was necessary because he said to himself as he was uh, sitting in, the, in those sand dunes, maybe the sanctions would have worked. Maybe we didn't have to go to war. Now, I argued with him that they wouldn't, that the coalition would have collapsed and so on and so forth. But uh, I'm merely reporting that because I think it bears out the concern you have. And uh, uh, it may be that uh, having an awful lot of preponderance in weapons and having a Congress that wants to know what it's getting for its money may tempt you to use those weapons rather than, you know, be patient and wait for negotiations to take place. But I, I, again, I want to urge that we have changed our behavior rather dramatically. Take the Haiti example. The president immediately said, let's see what the OAS wants to do, the Organization of American States. We've, we've behaved unilaterally in the past, and we got a bad reputation for it. Let's not repeat that. And I think this is part of a very good pattern, the pattern that we established in the UN, the pattern that will perhaps act as a very a good check on the uh, uh, too easy use of force. Just one last quick comment, and that is on, although there are some very fancy high-tech weapons which have cost very fancy um, amounts of dollars, the, uh, most of the tonnage dropped was straightforward dumb bombs. Um, that's how we how we went to war. And that's how we won the war, and uh, of course we did it by uh, a coalition. But it, that coalition included some customers just about as unsavory as Saddam Hussein. On behalf of the college and of the university, I want to thank the panel and the moderators. <laughs>